So I'm here to talk about uh, graph normal form. I'm going to assume that uh, you know everyone here has taken a database class and knows what normal forms are. Uh, I do have in the appendix, I'll share my slides with uh, Leonid so he can post them, but I do have uh, in the appendix uh, some explanation of uh, uh, normal forms and examples and so on. Okay, our interest in this is based on you know this challenge of trying to meet various communities where they are. We want them to you know use more and more graphs, <clears throat> and um, really more and more relational machinery. We think the relational model is a uh, you know still uh, hasn't realized its full potential. Uh, so what we what we we look at what we observe is that sort of uh, graphs and navigational queries and conceptual modeling uh, environments are preferred by the graph community actually in a couple of different flavors, the LPG and triple store uh, flavors, tables and SQL and BI tools are preferred by the business analyst uh, community, tensors and linear algebra and notebooks are preferred by data scientists and the ML community and um, JSON and GraphQL and IDEs and editors are preferred by the developer community. So we asked the question, you know, can we implement these abstractions as views on some uh, common internal representation and can we do that uh, and still keep performance? So today I'm not going to address really the performance uh, uh, dimension. I mean, we heard yesterday from Umbra, and, and I think they, you get a glimpse of uh, the kind of performance you can get if you do this the right way. All right, so our key insight is that the table, the tensor, the graph, the JSON, and other abstractions are just views on a graph normal form. And graph normal form is just six normal form plus things, not strings, okay? I'm going to assume you know my, my reference here and, and move on. A graph normal uh, form relation is a key plus uh, at most one other value. It's irreducible. You cannot normalize it further. And historically, using graph normal form in traditional SQL uh, databases has been performance suicide. The big knock on the relational model since its inception has been, you know, performance, will it ever perform? And so one way around that was to sort of pre-join uh, things into wider tables to avoid having to do joints, okay? Uh, and as again, you heard yesterday, uh, recent advances in worst case optimal join algorithms in semantic optimization have made it possible now to uh, support this sort of higher uh, form of normalization. Okay, let me walk you uh, quickly through some uh, use cases. Examples, I think, make things clearer. Uh, hopefully, um, most of you or all of you know the TPCH schema here. So just a traditional, I don't know, third normal form type uh, uh, relational schema. And what a graph normal form, you know, version of this would look like, I'm going to focus on the line item table here, is that you take uh, the line item table and you define it as a view that joins together these 14 tables, relations. Okay, so this is a 16 column table. It has two columns as keys and the rest are values. And you just sort of say, okay, this is a view that joins together all these things. So I've now reduced uh, uh, the, the schema to sort of its uh, atomic uh, form, okay? And I can, uh, I can ask questions, you know, I can run query uh, queries on this if I wanted to. And, and so I'll give you just a quick flavor here. You can look at the slides afterwards if you want of how we might write queries against that, uh, uh, you know, sort of in traditional, uh, f against the view that is the line item view, or we can write queries against the individual relations that uh, that table is uh, is defined by. Okay, so here I'm I'm using a point free notation to show uh, how you might sum the extended price times one minus the discount times one plus tax. Here I'm using point wise, where I'm you know reintroducing the variables for the, the column names. Uh, I can do composition. I know composition was something uh, Alistair uh, talked about being missing, and so I can sort of define. Uh, this uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the result in terms of sort of a, another view that I define here. Uh, and I can also support sort of relational uh, uh, navigational approaches, right? I can sort of, as, as uh, 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 Peter said just a few minutes ago, I, I keep telling everyone that navigation is really uh, joining. So here I'm navigating from, you know, trying to get a list of all the customers who are in Asia by joining together the nation uh, table and the region table and, and, and so on, okay? And because uh, these are joins, I can use a dot notation where the dot represents a join to actually navigate my way uh, through, uh, you know, through the, the relations to get to the customers that are in uh, Asia, okay? So uh, 
won't get into it, like I said, but you know, we've convinced ourselves that this can perform really, really well. This benchmark results are a couple of years, uh, year olds now, years old now. Uh, we'll refresh and update, and so we try to show uh, our progress here on performance in our production system. Okay, and so you really, uh, you know, the insight here is tables are really collections of hyper edge relations, and so this sort of simple table here might have an order key. And you can see sort of a, gra a graph representation of this, where the, the, the node uh, representing the order has a price, has a date, has a customer. This is another node representing another order, and it can sort of point to uh, another date. Okay, So tables are really a modularity construct on top of these individual uh, graph normal form uh, relations. Okay, Hopefully that's clear. Uh, all right, let's talk about graphs. Uh, so uh, let's see. So, you know, maybe you say business intelligence is easy. What about graphs? Well, we know, again, I've heard uh, multiple times in the last day and a half. The good news is you can sort of express uh, the uh, graph uh, queries uh, using an edge relation with self joins, with aggregation, and with recursion, recursion through aggregation. Okay. Again, historically, uh, it would have been performance suicide to do all this stuff on a sort of a classic relational uh, database implementation, uh, but no more. Okay, so here are some examples of how you might express a degree, degree query in SQL and Cypher and, and the tensor notation I showed you earlier using data frames and graph frames and so on. Here are uh, triangle query. Again, it's a, it's a self join of the edge relation uh, uh, three times uh, expressed in Cypher, SQL, and a relational notation like data log. Again, um, pretty straightforward, I think. Uh, uh, paths. Uh, again, represented the same way. You're joining through the edge relation uh, a few times here as well. Okay, and just to give you again a glimpse of that, why performance can be good. Uh, you know, I don't have time to uh, sort of give you the details of the benchmark, but because of the semantic optimization and the worst case optimal joins that we do here, uh, we can actually do very uh, this computation uh, very efficiently. Okay, and if you want sort of uh, more sophisticated examples, here is one where we are defining like a bunch of graph related queries like neighborhood and out degree and degree and whether something is reachable or not with transitive closure and the strongly connected components, the weakly connected components, the cosine similarity, the Jacquard similarity, uh, you know, very straightforward representation of, uh, of what you're trying to do and how you're, you're navigating and defining sort of a, a graph workloads. In the appendix for your reference, I also have between the centrality defined and you can check that out later, okay? Uh, and of course, you know, uh, things like labeled property graphs, I mean, triple stores, it should be obvious uh, how you do those, uh, but labeled property graphs may be slightly less obvious, but pretty obvious, right? So when you have relations that can be, that can have uh, keys with arity more than one, uh, you can sort of model something like a property like role and saying, okay, so the, the, for the edge that maps actor to movie, there is this, uh, this relation that lets you uh, keep track of the role. Okay, pretty straightforward mapping um, de decomposes everything into relations. Okay, so you know you can have this sort of relational representation and, and, uh, of graphs in a system that has indices, that has materialized views, worst case optimal joins, semantic optimization, recursion, and a higher order syntax. And this is important. We don't have time to get into it today, but you can um, look for some of Martin Stock's online, and you can see how we use sort of higher order syntax to quantify over relation names, because that's one of the key advantages, I think, that graph queries have, uh, graph query languages have over uh, SQL, okay? You can uh, uh, quantify over the, uh, the relation names, okay? And uh, again, you get reasoning, you get hypergraphs, temporal features, you can do it with performance and, and, and again, skip through that. Okay, let me show you a couple more use cases. Uh, linear algebra actually falls out of this as well. So, you know, uh, you know, linear algebra libraries tend to sort of conflate or be specialized for sparse and dense and all of that. All of these things are physical uh, uh, concerns that really should be sort of in the background and the relational model sort of relieves us from having to care about physical representation concerns. Okay, and so if you have joins, aggregation, recursion, you can do uh, uh, linear algebra. Historically, that has been performance suicide. Again, systems like Umbra, uh, you know, at Cider have shown that you can actually do really a good job, actually, of sparse linear algebra anyways, uh, uh, with uh, sort of a relational machinery. Okay, and going back to our line item example, you can see that if you squint a little bit, each one of these 14 relations 
uh, is a kind of a matrix, right? It's a two-part key, and one one part is sort of the rows in the matrix, and the other uh, is the is the are the columns in the matrix. And so you can operate on those uh, 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 normalized relations as as uh, matrices or as tensors. Okay, so. Again, very straightforward mapping between what is a vector. It's a vector has a sort of an implicit uh, row uh, number here, and it's a binary relation with a functional dependency between the, the first and the second columns. And a matrix, again, is a row columns being mapped to functional dependency to some, some value. Okay, you know, very cool to think of sort of relations being a universal abstraction that also subsume tensors. Okay, and I'm, I'm sure many of you have seen this before, but you can you know, express things like matrix uh, multiplication and other uh, linear algebra operators and tensor algebra uh, operators in a very straightforward way. And, uh, you know, here's what the math looks like in the book, here's what a SQL might look like, and here's sort of a more um, sort of a cleaner syntax uh, for these types of operators uh, where it sort of very closely approximates uh, the math. Okay, uh, another use case is the JSON use case. Uh, lots of you know systems sort of in, implement special support for JSON, or if they kind of partial support for JSON, they might like partially shred the JSON document, but not fully. Uh, uh, again, it doesn't take uh, uh, you know much of a, a, a insight here to see how if you have graph normal form as a target, you can take a, any JSON document and map it uh, uh, to graph normal form. And uh, you know, as you do, you organize the, 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 the nested sort of structure of these documents, you can sort of see these as being uh, keys that have symbols that map to uh, the values that are in the JSON document. Okay, don't have time today to dig into that too much, but again, ask Martin or ask me or ask, uh, watch some of our videos online. And uh, in sort of this mapping, you get very clean and efficient uh, support for all of the JSON documents. So including arrays and so on. You don't have to do schema inference and you don't have to uh, you know, have inefficient handling of uh, erroneous data. Uh, you know, import plus query as well as construct and export. Like it's, uh, and you can you know, bring in a, a, any JSON document and then export, you know, internally shred it to graph normal form and then export it and you get back exactly the same JSON document. So, so you can do this round tripping. Uh, and you don't need any special constructs in the query language to deal uh, to deal with this. Uh, where a lot of a lot of languages sort of add nesting features uh, uh, to do so. Okay, so my claims here is that graph normal form lets us support domain specific syntax. Uh, we have our own uh, language called RHEL that gives us sort of relational and tensor dialects of a language. You can learn more about it by going to docs.relational.ai. Uh, we've added SQL support. We're in the process of adding SQL support by putting. Uh, 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 DuckDB in front of our system and giving it sort of the defining uh, modules as a way of grouping together relations that have the same key and to DuckDB those look like tables and it just we have full high fidelity uh, DuckDB support for uh, for SQL. We've also mapped this to a domain specific language coming out of Goldman Sachs. I think Alistair mentioned this earlier. Uh, very, very direct mapping. And hopefully it's not hard to see how we can do GraphQL, Sparkle, uh, GQL uh, mappings to uh, this representation. Okay, I didn't cover uh, this today, but you can do time series also in this model. You don't need specialized time series models. You can do functional programming. We've been starting to see pe people write papers about how to map functional programs to data log and relational languages. And then you can also support diagramming, uh, diagrammatic and visual languages. In the appendix, I have a quick uh, example. Uh, furthermore, you get other benefits. You don't have to deal with nulls and three-valued logic anymore. You know, see Leonid's work on this. You can support uh, DML pretty easily uh, because you're just updating the in and inserting and, and so on in the individual relations. Uh, you improve semantic stability uh, uh, significantly, so you can make schemas changes without having to uh, do major surgery on sort of your tables or, or, or whatever sort of static schema uh, uh, convention you have. So you can support schema on demand, something that we've discussed here in the last day and a half. Uh, it improves analytic qu query performance because it sort of maps corresponds to column stores. And it's sort of ironic that uh, the relational, the SQL database community actually did this kind of thing at the physical level before really doing it at the, uh, at the you know, logical level. And also makes it easy to support temporal features like transaction time and valid time and so on, because every piece of information is uh, stored discreetly. 
So there's a lot of abstraction goodness that you know comes from this that we've been too scared uh, to use because of the fear of performance uh, hit of binary joins and not having complete uh, uh, optimizers. Okay, so thank you, and uh, I'm happy to take questions or. Uh, if you have them now or you have them later, please reach out to me or Martin or Leonid or anyone at Relational AI, and we'll be happy to talk about them. Thank you very much, Morgan. <laughs> Questions from the room? I don't see any hands. There is a hand from Domagoy. Go ahead. Uh, thanks for the talk. Just a very naive question. Have you tried, or do you know if someone had tried using GNF to compress graphs and see what are the results? I mean, because like the example you show, you know, when you have this one that goes to a date, you could have 10 million orders that store the same date, right? And you would still store it this way, you just store it once. So, you know, if anyone's tried yeah. this. Well, I don't, I, you know, the way I normally think about compression in this context is that compression is a physical concern and it should not sort of permeate up to the, the surface model, okay, the surface mm. abstraction of relations. And so underneath the covers, you have total freedom to do whatever you want, right? So a lot of uh, column stores, uh, you know, take advantage of compression because you have similar data group next to each other in storage and you can do uh, all sorts of things. You can also do run length encoding. Uh, in certain contexts, and, and there's also an opportunity with compressed data, like in most cases, people decompress the data and then operate on it. But you can actually think through examples where your query evaluator can operate on compressed data directly and not have to decompress it to operate on it. And I think there can be huge asymptotic wins uh, if you if you let the, the compression uh, interplay with the evaluation, but not make it a conceptual concern. Just keep it underneath the covers. Mm, or actually, I think the question is even more naive than you interpreted it. It was like, basically, if you viewed your data as you have on the right, then you never repeat a date in the table. You know, you yeah. would have a different table, right? So, yeah. ah, but what you're saying, you can further compress on that. Okay, yeah, yeah. fair yeah. enough. Yeah, 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 because then you can do all this. Okay, cool. That, that's really nice. And another question is, so when you show the scripting language, so this, or I would call it script-ish like language, when you show like centrality and graph oh, oh, uh, metric yeah. optimization, yeah. yeah, like these things. Yeah. yeah. So these run directly in the engine? Yeah, this is a relational query. If you squint a little bit, it's like a data log query here, right? Where you can- Ah, okay, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, and because you have the ability to define views and compose, you can just sort of build it up without having to have one big query that tries to do all of these things at the same time, right? Remember, you know, Alistair's comments about, you know, the lack of uh, composition in, in sort of in this world is, you know, creates issues for adoption, right? Because people don't want to keep sort of the big query in their head. They want to decompose it in pieces and sort of... Uh, yeah. And in the appendix, uh, I didn't get a chance to show you, but like with, with, between the centrality, there's a really, it's cool that you, you can take a sort of a textbook algorithm for uh, defining it. And you just, again, map it very almost one-to-one -one directly to, uh, to RHEL uh, in this case. Uh, but from our perspective for user communities, I really love SQL. We show them SQL, they get SQL. <laughs> a particular column can be computed in, uh, in, in this kind of stored relational language as opposed to a stored procedural language. And the column is computed in, in the same way that, you know, the same relational machinery uh, that, you know, drives everything, right? So you have the ability now uh, to take stuff that would have been historically in procedural code and analyze it and optimize it and compress it and paralyze it and incrementalize it, uh, just like everything else that you do in the uh, in sort of the uh, the more popular relational fragment SQL. There is a question Thank you. Uh, from Alistair. Uh, hi there. I, I may have missed this. Sorry, I didn't see the very beginning of your of your talk. Um, is RHEL um, developed as, I can't remember what it's called, the way in which you do domain-specific languages in Julia? Is it an extension of Julia effectively or a, like an overlay? Mm -hmm. yeah. No, no, it's not like, it's not something like a syntax that you can get to in, uh, in Julia. We use Julia to build a parser and to build a type right. checker and to build all of that kind of stuff. You can use it at the sort of at the language level. No, I yeah, I mean, we, we, we could do some variant of RHEL that way, but that's not where, uh, that's not what hasn't been our priority. Yeah, okay. 
Thanks. Okay, thanks very much for the interesting talk. Thank you.